This is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast here on newdiscourses.com or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing, all that. Um, For those of you who are contributors and supporters, thank you for that. Uh, It's a... I've been talking about a new idea lately, and I've mentioned it here on the podcast called Identity Marxism. I've got a book coming, you know, every watch out always for somebody with a book coming. That's all they're going to talk about. I've got a book coming where I'm going to name critical race theory, race Marxism, um, fairly soon. That will be the title of the book. So keep your eyes open for that. Uh, it's in the final kind of editing and typesetting stages, uh, and the references stages. <sighs> but anyway, um, I need to kind of lay out just kind of in a very simple, straightforward, clear way, what is identity Marxism and where did it come from and how did we get here? And so I'm going to just reel it back and just going to talk off the cuff. I didn't make notes for this. I'm just going to roll a little bit and talk about what I mean by identity Marxism. I think this is very similar to what, um, although I haven't actually read his book, uh, to what Mark Levin calls American Marxism. And it's certainly an American Marxist thing um, because it's what worked in America. Marxists are only concerned with what works. And that's actually going to be the first thing I'm going to put forth. Um, So to do this, we've got to walk all the way back to Marxism, understand what Marxism is and how Marxism works. And then we're going to come forward to today where we have identity Marxism. And of course, all the I mean, all the breadcrumbs for this podcast are out there in other podcasts. I've already covered basically all of this. We're going to talk about a number of species of Marxism. And one of those, the first of those is going to be just Marxism. Uh, I'm not going to get into, this is an important tangential point. At some point, we've got to talk about the difference between Marxism and Bolshevism, I guess, but we kind of don't Um, Bolshevism is the kind of very applicable form of Marxism that worked, that Lenin cooked up. The Bolsheviks were uh, under Lenin, uh, under Lenin's direction eventually, and that's what what worked to achieve a revolution in Russia in 1917. And um, I've already pointed out that I think Stalin basically brought to fore Leninism 2.0, and uh, frankly, Khrushchev kind of softened all of this. And then, but Mao, I brought into what I call Leninism 3.0. And then woke is uh, Leninism 4.0. I did a podcast on that. I think it, it centers on Antonio Gramsci. Um, and Leninism 4.0, it's also, you could actually say that these are Bolshevism 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. So woke is actually Bolshevist more than it is strictly Marxist. But that's also to say that the theory is ultimately Bolshevist, or sorry, that the theory is ultimately Marxian underneath it. And it's using a Bolshevik model on top of that to um, achieve its goals, which Bolshevism basically boils down to there being a vanguard party, an enlightened set of elites who are now going to walk society through the revolution because the stupid peasants won't get their act together and form a solid workers party that becomes the dictatorship of the proletariat. So they're going to force a dictatorship of the proletariat and they're going to use, you know, as Mao had it, you know, power flows from the barrel of a gun. Nobody has to ask any questions about the brutality of, um, Soviet style and Eastern European style uh, Bolshevism or Marxism, communism either. It's very clear that the goal was to uh, create an elite vanguard that was going to enforce socialism on everybody. We call this anti-racism in critical race theory now. We have a dictatorship of the anti-racist as a vision for, uh, so people like Ibram Kendi have done that many times. I'm not going to do it again here, but um we're not going to split hairs. When I say Marxism, it's applicable form that actually ends up doing something turns out to be Bolshevism every time. We're not going to, we're going to split hairs. I want to talk about the progression from kind of original vulgar Marxism into cultural Marxism, into neo-Marxism, into what I now refer to as identity Marxism, which if we follow Jose Medina, who's one of the theorists in the kind of woke school of thought, um, has gone kaleidoscopic. Now there are multiple very many, you know, there's this complicated matrix of oppression 
now, right? A matrix of domination as have complicated every possible line of social stratification that you can imagine based on identity or whatever is relevant. But what this is, is the adoption of uh, identity politics by neo-Marxism. And this is not a hard story to tell. It's amazing that it hasn't been told clearly, probably because our academics have proven themselves virtually useless. The ones who are, who most of them don't know what's going on. They're asleep or something. And then the ones who do know what's going on are tend, they tend to be so caught up in the like little minutia of academic detail that they miss the forest for the trees as it were. And, and have not told this story very well, which is shocking that, you know, a relative amateur like myself is able to just see it so clearly and be able to talk about it. But so all the way back to Marxism, so we can get to identity Marxism which is just Marxist theory and aims and application through identity politics. That's all I mean by identity Marxism. It's using identity politics to do Marxism, to achieve something like a modified version of communism, which happens to be now, and this is the, if we go back to Leninism or Bolshevism 4.0, that is blended with the, 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 with, with corporatism and actually communism and fascism have blended themselves, which is very useful as a cloak for them. They can't see, it becomes very difficult to see that this is a communist movement if it's simultaneously fascist, because the second you say it's communist, they can say it's fascist. The second you say it's fascist, they can say it's communist, which is anti-fascist. And they're actually lying. It's both at the same time mixed together. Uh, and the Deng Xiaoping in China actually pioneered that model uh, after Mao. Um, and that's the model that runs in China today. The difference, by the way, between Western and Chinese in this case would be that the Western attempt is going to put the fascism on top and the communism beneath. And in the Chinese model, the communism's on top and the fascism's underneath. But I digress. Okay, so Marx, Marxism, the first thing you have to understand about Marx is that Marx did not give a shit about anything he talked about. And you might think that that's ridiculous. No, the only thing Marx cared about was tearing down the society that he hated, the society that he resented, because maybe he wasn't elite enough, or he wasn't respected enough, or whatever. This, whatever. Maybe he's just a Satanist. I mean, he actually said he was. So, uh, you know, and Satanist can be interpreted quite literally that he wanted to tear down God or re reject God or whatever. It can also, in a kind of a theological literal sense, it can also be interpreted as hating the order of the world and kind of a Petersonian, you know. Uh, religious metaphor sense. And Marx was in a, unambiguous that this is his, his driving operation. So Marxism has to be understood as a set of ideas used specifically to achieve the revolution. I would articulate in the language that I now use that the goal of this revolution is actually to pull society back out of a free state, which is capitalism, representative democracy, uh, universal liberalism, um, freedom, liberty, you know, the whole thing, secured property rights, etc. Uh, the kind of Lockean vision, which could be adjusted, of course, uh, from Locke himself, but it's to pull people back. If we look at Marx's stages of history, you know, he says the first stage of history is this kind of primitive communism. Uh, in the tribal sense, and then it progresses into slavery, and then it progresses into feudal estates with certain aristocrats in charge who he hated and resented. And then it progresses into this new stage of capitalism and freedom that uh, gives everybody kind of access to do the best they can with what they have and to be treated as individuals and all of these things. And he says that the goal is to go forward into an administered economy of socialism that is actually going to achieve a, uh, a successful, you know, transition into a stateless, classless utopia called communism. But this is, in pro that's, that's words. It's words. The goal is actually to, to achieve the revolution, to go back to a new feudal estate economy or structure of society. A new feudalism where the Marxists are in charge. They are the new aristocrats. The goal is to replace the elites with themselves, is to tear down a society that has become more free, but obviously still stratified and still hierarchical and it still has elites, is to tear down the existing structure and elites so that they can become the new elites. And, and socialism is unambiguously feudal. It's just that the party with its over, overbearing ideology becomes the uh, organizing principle of society. 
And the Marxists, of course, are in charge of that ideology. They're the only ones allegedly who understand it. So they get to naturally be the new aristocracy that gets to live off the the largesse of society and basically run it into the ground. It, it's actually a pullback. It's actually a very reactionary thing. It's, oh my God, this freedom means that I can't succeed because I suck. And therefore, this is the Marxist view. And therefore, let's tear it down and go back to a, Let's go back to a system where, where there's a hierarchy in society that I get to be in charge of. And the way they're going to bill it out is that if you keep going backwards far enough, and you see what happens when the Bolshevism comes in, you actually retreat back from the aristocracy into a form of, of literal like slavery. You do what the party tells you. You work according to them. They pay you some pittance. There's bread lines. You can't get your goods. Everything's rationed. It's the equivalent of slavery. And then eventually the idea would be that, oh, now we're going to have a universal communism, communism becoming the last stage. There's going to be this universal thing that happens. But it's no longer tribal communism. It's not going to be universal communism. It's a pipe dream. It doesn't. It's not going to work. And it never works. And it's just a catastrophe. But it's actually an extraordinarily reactionary uh, position to have. And in fact, what you have to understand, though, about Marxism is that all of the Marxian theory is just tools to try to achieve the revolution, which enable the Marxists to become the new aristocracy, to run a new feudal economy that in its failure will become a slave economy with the pipe dream that it will become a utopia at the end of the rainbow, the end of the communist rainbow that they don't know how to get to. So Marxism shouldn't, we could talk all day long about labor theory of value, surplus value, exploitation, or whatever. Reject all those terms. There's no reason to talk about those. Marxism is the attempt to use class as the dividing tool in order to achieve the revolution that's going to put the Marxists in power. That's it. Marxism is a revolutionary ideology. It is how do we get to a revolution? Marx saw economic class, material conditions, and the agitation under, you know, kind of very abusive industrial capitalism in the mid 19th century. He saw that as the most fruitful place to agitate. Well, there are other places to agitate as well. As Marcusa points out, for example, and we'll talk about this, the, the energy left the working class and it switched into identity classes. And that's the birth of identity Marxism that we're going to get to in a little bit. So you have to understand that Marxism has nothing to do with economics has nothing at all to do with economics. It's not even economic theory. It's a revolutionary strategy. And the point is to achieve the revolution so that the Marxists get to be in charge. And the thing that Marx saw, and so the thing he focused on, but it could have been anything else, had it been something else that would be more fruitful, to tear down the existing society and establish himself or people in his orbit as in charge was economic class under the literally abusive stage of uh, an exploitative stage of industrial capitalism. There's no reason to believe that Marx actually gave half a shit about the working class. He wasn't in the working class. What you see in Marxism, in fact, Marxism of all these stripes is actually a disease, a psychological disease of the lower upper class. It's people who are not the upper upper class and resent them and hate them and hate the society that enables them to be better while also having a revulsion and disgust against the lower classes that they don't want to have to consider themselves a part of. It is a resentment-based psychological disorder of the lower upper class. And the class can be defined in all kinds of different ways, social class, economic class, etc. And it's a rebellion against that and an attempt to tear down those elites that you hate without ever having to become the nasty working class schlubs that you don't want to be. This is why the very smart people are this are part of the problem, by the way. They are in that. They aren't as resentful. The very smart people are not resentful of the elites. They do, however, have that same innate nasty revulsion against the everyday working class, normal, not even working class, normal people. They have, they have this kind of elitism about this, about them. We've talked about elite overproduction. This is how that piece of the puzzle fits in. So you have to understand Marxism as just a set of tools to get to a revolution that's going to establish that the people who ad adopt a Marxian theory get to be in charge of society afterwards in a new aristocracy that, like I said, because of its intrinsic uh, tendency toward failure is going to eventually become a new slavery that's eventually going to, uh, it, it, it is in, in the, in the carrot, you know, that's driving this this donkey down the road that's being hung out in front of it is that we'll get to this primitive communist state again where everything's shared equally, it's classless, it's stateless, but it'll apply globally or even at least nationally, but globally is the real agenda rather than in tribes that we can create one giant global tribe of communists who act in a communistic way, which turns out not to be the case. 
human beings turn out not to work that way. Um, and it's very important to understand Marxism as that. So all of these strains of Marxism are the same because that's what Marxism boils down to. Economics was just the convenient tool at the time to try to achieve the revolution that would then empower the Marxists. It's a totally self-serving ideology. It's a complete, as Eric Vogelin put it, a complete intellectual swindle. Marx knew that his stuff didn't actually line up. It didn't actually add up. That it doesn't work. And he even said, don't question me. You know, it's, it's don't question it. Just believe it. Only the people he said who are socialist man, only socialist man can actually understand this, which is just this Gnostic consciousness. And it's also just a guru kind of Jim Jones bullshit that, you know, the enlightened elect can understand it and everybody else cannot, but it's actually trying to pull back what it doesn't matter which sector of broadly using the word economy, the social economy, the material economy, uh, the information economy, whatever it happens to be, it's just an attempt to pull back from freedom into a new aristocracy with different people in charge who happen to be these highly resentful upper middle class or sorry, well, yes, to a degree, but also lower upper class people who are then using the downtrodden as their human shields and props to make their argument. And that if you don't understand Marxism as that, you don't understand it. And then it becomes very easy then to understand the rest of this progression. So the Marxism didn't work. Uh, you got your Bolshevism did. You get your 1917 uh, Russian Revolution. And then you have the Soviet state established under Lenin uh, and the Bolsheviks. And that was obviously a catastrophe. Um, but here's the problem. Marxian theory in the books, the high theory, which should not be questioned, can only be comprehended by so, uh, socialist man or under Lenin, Soviet man. Uh, it turns out that the, it, Marx's prediction was that you know history has these six stages and that the contradictions in each stage lead to the next stage. And so here you have a feudal stage three society in Russia, a feudal peasant society in stage three, same thing that you actually had in China, by the way, in the 1960s, when Mao, well, 50s, and then again, 60s, when Mao did his stuff, you have this feudal peasant society, stage three, that then has this Bolshevik revolution and jumps into stage five, socialism. And stage four got skipped entirely. There was never freedom. There was never capitalism. Not really. And so Marx, you know, the Marxists of the 1910s and 20s are looking around and they're seeing, well, Marx said stage one would go to stage two because of the contradictions would go to stage three because of the contradictions would go to stage four because of the contradictions would go to socialism spontaneously because of the contradictions. And then that was those contradictions under the correct rule now would start to work themselves out spontaneously. What I call the communism spontaneity thesis. And when, uh, which is that eventually if you enforce equity or socialism long enough, then justice or communism becomes spontaneous and just works. That's the end of the communist rainbow. That's the part where they don't know how. If they just force their shit long enough, it's going to work. That's the, con the communist all by itself. That's the communist spontaneity thesis. And then at that point, history has progressed. But here's their problem. The example that they had that worked, the only example that worked, was the Russian society had achieved stage three, and then there was no stage four. The contradictions of stage three did not lead to uh, anything. As a matter of fact, stage four never emerged. And then it just leapt by revolu by Bolshevik re revolution into stage five, which is a problem because the theory was not fulfilled. Furthermore, if you look at the major industrial centers, especially the one that, uh, that Marx himself wrote in London, uh, but you could look at Berlin, you could look, um, I guess to Paris, you could look to, uh, the developing, uh, European context, you could also jump across the Atlantic and you could look at New York and Chicago and LA and, you know, various other industrial centers rising in the United Detroit for whatever, you know, maybe it's a little early for Detroit. Detroit came later, but you could look at these different, um, industrial centers rising in the United States and, and, in, and across Europe. And you don't see these contradictions aren't working out. I mean, Antonio Gramsci, the, the great cultural Marxist, if we can use the word great in the sense of big, but not in the sense of good, um, became actually a Leninist, a Bolshevist, because, specifically because the stupid Italian workers' parties wouldn't do what they were supposed to do. They wouldn't take the step to become a powerful political bloc that was then going to overturn society. And he was like, well, these 
basically, you know, these idiots need to be shepherded. We do need a vanguard approach. Uh, George Lukács in Hungary was even further down that road. And these two are kind of the fathers of cultural Marxism. They was even further down that road. These idiots need to be shepherded through this. And like he was extraordinarily an extraordinary Bolshevist in that regard, a vanguardist and a stagist. Uh, these are being different terms for different aspects of how uh, communist thought was operating during the, uh, I don't know if that's the first or the second international at that point. And so there was a big problem for Marxism at the time in the 1910s and 1920s, which is that Marx's theory was wrong. And this, like it, Everywhere you looked, it wasn't what was happening. The only place that, it, the, that a revolution succeeded was in Russia, which was in stage three and skipped ahead to five, which is to say they just reorganized their feudal structure. If we remember that it's just a reactionary theory post-revolution uh, or that seeks a revolution to reorganize who's in charge um, and the freedom stage never occurred. And then um, if you look at the places where the freedom stage is occurring, it's not working. And then this demanded an answer. And so uh, the answer that people like Lukács and uh, Gramsci gave was that oh, well, the cultural values of these more advanced societies are too uh, rich and stable. They, the, the, value, the cultural values stabilize. Uh, you know, what, what does it mean to be a member, a citizen in high standing? What does it mean to be a cultured individual in this society? What are the values? You know, how do you hold yourself? What, what does dignity mean? What's, what does decorum mean? What is the, what's sensible? What is un, insensible? These ideas became very core to this development out of Marxism into cultural Marxism. And, uh, the idea was that, oh, well, well, rather than seizing the means of cultural production or sorry, seizing the means of material production, I should say, as the Marxists, the vulgar Marxists wanted to do. We have this more sophisticated theory now where if we want that to be able to be achievable later, we first have to seize the means of cultural production. And of course, this is what Mao put into practice with his, you know, relentless campaign against the four olds. Um, the Great Leap Forward, by the way, in China, which was a total catastrophe, was an attempt to seize the material uh, conditions, the uh, means of production, and it failed utterly to millions dying. It was a complete, complete disaster. And so what happens? You know, a decade later, they come back around with a cultural revolution, creating a cultural red guard that's supposed to destroy uh, the four old, is that Suju or something like that in Chinese? Um, old habits, old customs, old ways of thinking, uh, old traditions or something like this. I'd have to look up what the four are again. But the idea was that you're going to eliminate old culture completely. You're going to have a cultural revolution that then paves the ground. Why do you have to have a cultural revolution? Because the culture that exists is resisting the revolution. People don't want their lives disturbed. They actually don't want to go into this pipe dream. A lot of them actually see through it or suspicious of it. So you have to prepare the ground by doing a cultural revolution. And of course, what they learned is with, with Mao, for especially, is that it works best if you do it with young people, with students. You create a red guard, young, naive, idealistic people who think the world can still be shaped, however, and according to whatever possibilities you might imagine. And don't understand that, you know, in many regards, it actually is true that life is the way that it is and people are the way that they are. Now, they haven't been burned enough by life. I even have this idea that I refer to as the great disillusionment of the late 20s. Uh, it's a, I, if we were going to, if I was a dev, developmental psychologist, I'd probably look into this. So a lot of people think that, you know, deve developmental psychology ends at uh, the end of adolescence. But there's another phase that's called emerging adulthood that's said to correlate with the uh, the reorganization of the brain uh, as it transitions from a kind of very open ended growth um, model in adolescence and childhood into a kind of more entrenched adult uh, and it, plus the completion of the of the. Uh, prefrontal cortex. So they're, they're actually, and I'm no expert in this, but they're, they're actually neurobiological changes happening in the brain that correlate to this emerging adulthood. And so we all kind of know that um, people over 25, approximately, give or take a few years, are in some significant ways different than people who are under 25. But what I find is that there's a certain idealism that comes with youth and that somewhere around 27, you hit this wall of, is this all there is to life? this really is what it is. And there's this great disillusionment and that, well, so that that hasn't happened yet for young people. So they're very radicalizable, very easy to tip into, um, 
into idealistic radical movements because they have not all of them, of course, but many of them are because they actually haven't uh, entered into that full brain development yet. And they haven't had their great disillusionment. Now, of course, you can also radicalize people through the disillusionment. Look how terrible. And we see this happening kind of now with the millennials. Look how terrible life is. You were promised all this great stuff. You're not getting it. How look how disillusioned you are. The reason that this is all there is to life is because uh, the system sucks. And if we had a different system, it, it, it would be better. And that disillusionment, that alienation from the possibilities you viewed life viewed in life as a child uh, and an adolescent and a young adult, emerging adult, you know, falls apart. So there's an energy there. But these people realized anyway that students are very radicalizable, but they also realized that that's the, the basis, the youth are the perfect basis for a cultural revolution. And they also believe that you have to have a cultural revolution in order to pave the way for a material revolution. And this was cultural Marxism in a nutshell. Culture doesn't mean, by the way, anything to do with race yet. It has everything to do. It is actually very Eurocentric at this point, still uh, Western centric. It is everything to do in the 1920s, everything to do with uh, high culture versus low culture and the frustration at the emergence of a middle culture, like a middle class, which we might also call a popular culture. Um, and so cultural Marxism takes this view that what it emerges out of Marxism to explain the failures of Marx, Marx's theory in light of a, this anomalous success of the Bolshevik revolution in Russia to creating the Soviet union and the, uh, unexplainable failures of Marxian theory to explain why industrial centers like London, Berlin, Paris, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles are not becoming the epicenters of Marxian revolutions as he predicted. Um, so cultural Marxism then says, well, if we have culture, something produces that culture. And so now we're not going to seize the means of material production. We're going to seize the means of cultural production. And the way we do that is by seizing the, the, the culture, they said, is largely produced and transmitted through institutions. And that's a kind of a broad use of the word. And so the way that you change that is by entering into those institutions and creating a, they, they called it a counter hegemony within it. In other words, to flip it over to create a new cultural paradigm within the institutions that produce culture. In other words, to seize the means of cultural production. And so cultural Marxism, um, Gramsci named specifically faith, family, education, media, and law as key, um, religion, I should say, rather than faith, as key five key pillars of cultural production that had to be infiltrated. You had to get inside of those, turn them communistic from within with a new set of cultural values. This is obviously what Marcuse is talking about as well. He's tapping into that view when he gets into the idea of the interjection of values to create a biological foundation for socialism and the essay on liberation, which you should go listen to my series on that. It's the first part of that series. If you're looking for the specific one, the biological foundation for socialism and the second part is about uh, the new sensibility that's going to be interjected into those and the whole idea of introjection of morals to change man at a fundamental level. There you go. There's your socialist man that's got to be brought into consciousness so that he can understand the crackpot theory. Why? So that you can achieve the revolution, which is the whole point. And then you can have your regression uh, reframed as progression and that's the whole point of the Marxian theory. So they thought that we have to infiltrate these cultural institutions and change them from within. So you have to get inside religion and you have to create liberation theology. You have to get inside uh, the family. You have to decompose the idea of a nuclear family. You want to challenge the institution of marriage. You want to challenge the uh, idea of childhood innocence. You want to challenge the parent-child uh, relationship. You want to create discord and strife there. You want to suggest that the nuclear family is, in fact, a abusive structure that needs to be dismantled in order to stop sending it stop reproducing these cultural values from one generation to the next. And in fact, what you want to replace that with everybody wants to jump and say the state. No, the state is the ultimate institution. What you're actually trying to replace the family with is the institution. That could be as an institution like a orphanage. It could be an institution like a college or school, a public school, a university. Um, you actually want to replace the idea of the family with the institution. You want to make people institutional men, as it were. And that is a very deliberate, by the way, if you remember the film Shawshank Redemption or the book, if you read Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption by Stephen King, and rather than watching the movie, um, 
the uh, the goal is to actually make people institutional man, and that depends on the institution for its uh, ability to understand life and to succeed in in society. And then again, the ultimate institution that will bring all the other institutions under its purview is going to be the state, and that's how. Um, that thing. So you're going to replace the family with the institution uh, as the state with the ultimate institution. So religion is going to be turned into this kind of liberation theology that's just meant to cause strife and, re and revolution from a religious perspective to move the ideas of Marxism through a religious vehicle, which people will take on very, very seriously. So you're going to reframe religion into a uh, paradigm of, of, of teaching Marxist uh, theology, and it is a theology, uh, through the voice of, say, Catholic theology, or if it's black liberation theology, kind of black Protestantism or whatever. And then uh, family I've discovered. Uh, education obviously is a huge one. It's huge for Gramsci. It's actually the one that they all realized would work. Um, we have Isaac Gotsman. I'm going to do some podcasts on him soon. He's a uh, Marxist education uh, scholar. And uh, he has a book called The Critical Turn in Education. Very, very first thing in the book, actually the first sentence of the book says that all, where did all the 60s radicals go? It's the qu open question. And he says, well, you know, it's not to yuppie dumb. It's not to this. It's not to that. It's to the classroom. So, it, it, you know, Marcuse with his student revolution, he's talking about in the 60s and then uh, the, the Critical Turn in Education documenting it. It's that all of these radicals, all of these Marxists went into the classroom. Uh, they realized that education was the key, that if you could start educating educators and educating students, that within a generation or two, actually two generations, and by the third, the emergence of the third generation, which P.S., that's the one we're in, 50 years down the track from that, then you could actually turn over society. So whereas, you know, we often get accused of having whitewashed education, we've actually had for at least 50 years, very redwashed education, communist washed, red, redwashed education that is serving communist goals uh, because infiltrating education to turn it into a project to raise up the consciousness, critical consciousness of one form or another has become the explicit goal of education um, through that infiltration. And of course, it's very powerful. The media, uh, Hollywood and, you know, the, the news media has been even more effective because people think news is news, but in fact, and, and therefore, you know, relatively unbiased sharing of information. They think the Hollywood movies are just meant to be fun or television is just meant to be fun. Truth is actually, no, you can actually talk an agenda into that very easily. And that also can be redwashed. And so infiltrating media, but in particular news media and culture producing media, the, the films, et cetera, the way that people frame their experience in life is through stories. Film became the medium for telling those stories through the 20th century and television became the medium even further as the cable uh, era came into being infiltrating those institutions to uh, kind of set it, it's like I don't I'm not I've never done acid myself but I've talked to people who do acid and there's a lot of people who talk about set and setting the goal with taking over things like education and media and so on is to actually produce the set and setting for the society so that the bad trip of the revolution is guaranteed on the other side. So it's like an inverse of what's really going on when you're talking about set and setting in a, in a hallucinogenic um, kind of frame or whatever. But there, that's the goal. The goal of the media as a cultural production item for the cultural Marxists would be to frame out the set and setting for, for culture so that it can be turn into a revolutionary force. They're already thinking that way. Those are the values that are being interjected by the media they consume. They saw the emergence of pop culture. They hated it, but they also realized that co-opting it through propaganda would be the most effective way to change the set, the cultural set and setting of society so that they could go forward. And the last one, of course, is law. Law is very important. There are other cultural institutions we could talk about, I guess, as well. But with law, critical race theory grew out of the critical legal studies movement, which is a, del a deliberate attempt to force this stuff into law, which actually held out quite long against um, the rule of law, held out quite long against um, Marxist uh, hegemon uh, cultural hegemony building uh Attempts, but critical race theory turned out to be extraordinarily effective at saying that the law was not dealing with race the way that it should. Feminists were also, feminist lawyers were also very successful at saying it was not dealing with sex and then later gender the way that it should. 
And so those two uh, mass lines of action, feminism and critical race theory, were able to infiltrate law. And of course, if they get law, we're in big trouble. And they kind of have a lot of law. That everything in terms of discrimination law, that, that was a tool. I'm not against the Civil Rights Acts. I think they are wonderful. I think they're great. I think they're extremely important. But they have been reinterpreted through bad jurisprudence and bad law and bad law review articles. They have been reinterpreted to under to accept the disparate impact differences in average differences in outcomes on average by group as proof of discrimination uh, line, which is ultimately uh, Marxist stratification theory and conflict theory being applied in the set, setting of law. So the critical theory of law, actually, where you think that it could be very useful, Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, intersectionality has this front that's very acceptable, which is. Hey, look, if you hire lots of black men to work, say, in a factory floor and you hire lots of white women, say, to work in the offices, you're not discriminating by sex because you have lots of women. You're not discriminating by race because you have lots of black people, but you could actually completely discriminate against black women specifically. And that's a very valid point that if we had a liberal uh, critical theory, which is, of course, oxymoronic in the formal sense, but if you catch what I mean, that we're looking for blind spots in what we have operating. Uh, in a liberal way and asking the pertinent questions to open up, you know, open up that situation to figure out what's actually going on. You actually do have a legitimate loophole there. That's the front she gives for intersectionality. But then inter intersectionality becomes, even though she says it shouldn't be, a totalizing theory of identity. That's everything about relational power structures and understanding yourself in terms of your identity first as a tool for understanding the stratification of society, blah, 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 blah. So you you actually can, can kind of see where... Um, where, you know, they're able to kind of like wedge their way in or whatever, and then use something that sounds very reasonable and important to kind of reframe everything into this kind of Marxian lens. Uh, and that's exactly, exactly how this works. So the idea, though, with cultural Marxism was it must be the cultural forces that are preventing revolution. So if we can infiltrate in kind of a generational political warfare strategy, the produce the the means of cultural production. We can change the set and setting for society to prepare the ground for revolution, and those are going to primarily be religion, family, education, media, and law, according to Gramsci. Um, Lukács had similar ideas. He was the education minister, if you will, or within the Hungarian uh, Soviet project, um, or second to the minister, I guess. I don't think he was the minister, but he was high up in the educational uh, program. And he was very interested, by the by, in bringing in uh, deviant sexual politics, degenerate sexuality into the education system and into children, de degenerate sex ed. Herbert Marcuse also was an advocate for this kind of thing. Why? To destabilize the young people so that their set and setting would be so that they're confused and so that they are dealing with inappropriate uh, themes for their developmental stage so that they would be easily manipulable, to they'd be disgruntled so they would turn on their parents and their parents would turn, turn back on them. Uh, he understood this. So he understood the need to infiltrate these cultural institutions and he was very interested in education in particular. And so um, that's what cultural Marxism was about. Again, Marxism is how do you get to the revolution? And so Marx was like agitate on cultural or sorry, agitate on economic conditions. The cultural Marxists were hate capitalism, blame capitalism for everything, but we're going to actually agitate on culture. And in fact, we're going to now institute what later got called by Rudy Deutschke, a long march through the institutions. Uh, we're going to generate generationally through political warfare take over the institutions to create new cultural conditions that will then prefer, will, will then uh, uh, till the till the soil for the revolution the point is just to get the revolution every other argument is just a tool that they're using to try to get there uh, that's Marxist theory in general so out of this cultural Marxist milieu we end up having the Institute for social research emerge there's also Marxist feminism emerging around it, actually earlier than this, but it's a kind of a cultural Marxist force, but I'm not going to go into all the Marxist feminism. It's pretty easy to understand. Uh, it's exactly what you would expect. It's using feminism, so the male-female sex uh, difference, to claim that there's an important stratification, which in, say, the 19... 
1910s, there was, uh, 1880s, 1890s, there was, uh, much more patriarchal and even sometimes misogynistic or even openly misogynistic society, where actually there's a very different definition of the ro the roles that men and women play, those sex roles. And so there, a Marxian view can be taken of that and Marxist feminists can do a kind of cultural Marxism through feminism that kind of grew in its own semi-independent line that swoops back in much later when it becomes the post-structuralist feminists that kind of take over everything in the identity Marxist turn uh, later, but we'll come back to that. So what you have, though, is this Institute for Social Research emerging in, originally at, at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Of course, um, it's emerging. I think it emerged in 1923. I could double check the date. Uh, has a, about a 10 year run there in Frankfurt. And then Hit Hitler claims the chancellorship of Germany in 1933. Not the best place in the world to be, given that virtually every member of the Frankfurt School was Jewish. Um, so they had to. And also, by the way, Hitler was no fan of the communists. Um, so they had to GTFO from. Uh, Frankfurt, and they at first ducked out and went to Geneva in Switzerland, hid there for two years, and eventually got imported uh, kind of a refugee status into the United States. Uh, universities adopted them. Uh, Herbert Marcuse gets stuck in the OSS, which is the precursor to the CIA, uh, to help fight the Nazis, etc. And also, well, that explains a lot about the deep state. Um, I think it probably does explain a lot about the deep state and why we live in Herbert Marcuse's world. But uh, they end up in the United States by uh, 1935. And so this and, and Max Horkheimer takes over the, the directorship, I think, in 33 or thereabouts. Max Horkheimer is the guy who defines the critical theory. The point of a critical theory, which is synonymous with neo-Marxism, OK, is synonymous with neo-Marxism. Critical theory means neo-Marxism. In fact, Isaac Gotsman, who I mentioned a minute ago, calls it critical Marxism. He doesn't even call it critical theory. He says that it's critical Marxism. And this is one of them. This is a woke person, not an outside critic, trying to stick a label. This is one of them. This is critical Marxism. And uh, he, he devise, devises a critical theory... And, I, you know, I've discussed this before by pointing out that he did believe that Marx was wrong. He's not quite the same as the cultural Marxists. You know, Antonio Gramsci's and uh, George Lukács' strategies are, you know, known to him to a degree. But it's actually with Gramsci, it gets a little complicated because in 1926, uh, Gramsci went to prison in Italy. The fascists imprisoned him and he did most of his work in prison, dying in 1937, I think, the same year that Horkheimer wrote Crit Traditional and Critical Theory, uh, where critical theory gets its first actual definition. Well, that work that Gramsci did between 26 and 37 when he died certainly would not have been known to the prison notebooks, would not have been known to Horkheimer. Those were smuggled out of the Italian prison to Moscow virtually immediately upon his death, but certainly they were in a hidden in a locker in the prison with Gramsci, who was not communicating with the outside uh, was not allowed to communicate with the outside while he was writing them. And so um, it gets a little difficult there, the, the bridge between neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism. But the, the idea with cultural Marxism, or sorry, with neo-Marxism is that we have this new critical theory that, that Horkheimer said, well, we, we realize a few things that Marx got wrong. Of course, they're looking at the same failure that the cultural Marxists looked at, which was that the revolutions weren't proceeding as they were supposed to. Again, we're just, how do we get to revolution? But what he's also saying is, oh, Marx failed to realize, he, in his own words, Horkheimer said, Marx failed to realize that, that, that justice and uh, freedom are dialectical concepts. And, you know, we've talked about dialectic a lot. I'm not going to go into it right now. What that means basically is that they are in contradiction to one another. So he says Marx believed that we could have this perfectly just world filled with freedom. And you could have both. You could have your cake and eat it too. We're going to have this perfectly free utopia world that's also perfectly just. But he says, no, what the, what the critical theory emerged from, and this is one of the kind of three things we should mention about where critical theory emerges from, is that justice and freedom are dialectical concepts. They're in contradiction to one another. That have to be uh, the, the Aufgehoben, the, the process of sublation, of, of tearing apart and lifting them up, has to be, the dialectical process has to be applied to them. But he literally, in his own words, exactly in his own words, except in German, says, 
that the more freedom you have, the less justice, the, le- the more justice you have, the less freedom. And again, as it's fallen out, justice is synonymous with, with communism. True justice only exists in a communist state. So he says, here's the problem then, that you actually have to severely limit freedom in order to have more justice. And that that's the kind of a, a huge contradiction that Marx didn't understand. And that's part of, for what Horkheimer believed, why Marxist theories failed. Um, a second big reason that uh, critical theory emerged was to incorporate the social sciences into Marxian theory and the emerging science, uh, sciences of psychology, especially Freud, and the emerging uh, science of sociology, especially that of Max Weber, uh, had to be included and worked in. And so it's going to become, I would actually just say it's a church of social science now. Uh, and it was very early on, the Frankfurt School just became kind of like the arch cathedral of, of social science as applied to Marxist agendas. And a lot of our social science, not necessarily all, but a lot of our social science actually grew out of that place. So the idea that our universities have become uh, churches or cathedrals of crackpot social science with a Marxian agenda is actually kind of what happened in history. And the the driving agenda of these people and the fact that they were so interested in the social sciences in a very particular way very early on so they could achieve their goals is very important. So in other words, what I want to say then is that critical theory came into existence to get inside the heads of people. Marx and Engels were very, were barely, barely concerned with the false consciousness, the idea that people are brainwashed by the conditions of society in order to, and don't realize the fullness of their servitude. The neo-Marxists, on the other hand, were completely in on this. Complete, that was, it's their main thesis, is that the heteronymous interests of society are actually conditioning people not to be aware of their servitude, and thus they need liberation from those Uh, generally successful conditions. And that's the third thing that critical theory came into existence or neo-Marxism came into existence to deal with is that advanced capitalism is succeeding. Advanced capitalism is working. It stabilized the working class. The working class is no longer a repository of revolutionary energy and a Marxian theory only exists to get to revolution. It's now a repository of conservative stabilizing energy counter-revolutionary energy in the working class. And how do you solve that problem? Horkheimer complains, you know, Marx believed that that the that capitalism would immiserate the worker and that immiseration would lead to alienation to a degree where finally they would come together in solidarity and overthrow uh, their oppressors and seize the means of material production and take o- take over the world. And that, he said, doesn't, isn't how it works. In fact, in his own words, he says, advanced capitalism allows the working class to build a better life, which he sees as a huge problem. I've ranted about this in many podcasts before. Marcusa takes up the same crusade that the working class has become stabilized, whether we're reading in um, in, in uh, One Dimensional Man, his 1964 book. You see it to a degree in his 1965 Repressive Tolerance. You see it very thoroughly in his 1969 Essay on Liberation. And of course, I did a podcast series. I, I, talk, I hit this idea specifically in a podcast about Marcuse and the new working class or the new proletariat. So you should check that out. But I also hit, I also have read Repressive Tolerance and Essay on Liberation in full with my commentary as two podcast series. So that's if you're bored, that's nine full-length podcasts, some of which are like close to three hours long about Marcusa. Uh, you can go check out at your leisure and see that this is really the way that they thought. And so uh, neo-Marxism becomes concerned with how do we convince people that they're actually oppressed when they don't believe they're oppressed because they actually have a good life and they've been stabilized. And so critical theory becomes this tool by which you induce uh, dependency and uh, the inability to live with society by picking at people and getting them to believe that they're actually enslaved by their freedom. It's literally Orwellian. Uh, it's literally that freedom is slavery, is, is the idea. It is the condition that maintains servitude. Um, and how do, you, how do you awaken people to realize that? And they, at first, you know, they banged on about cultural issues like the middle class, the pop culture, uh, Theodore Adorno hated pop culture. He just railed on it as a stabilizing force. It makes people enjoy their lives. You know, you can go to work, you can come home, you can enjoy the game, you can turn on some, you know, pop music that you're going to dance to, you're going to go out and have fun, you're going to go to the bar and chill out with your friends, you're going to have this whole middle culture. You know, it's not it's not the impoverished, awful, low culture culture. 
of um you know the the lower class the trash of society that's easily um exploited to create revolutionary energy you now have this stable happy pop middle culture and they hated it had to be has to be like completely wrecked so they have that aspect to neo-marxism of just railing on anything that makes the middle class happy and you might notice that that's the fa- the main thing they do to this day is anything that makes the middle class happy has to be destroyed right you like your football game? Well, we're going to put Black Lives Matter on the field. We're going to make people kneel. We're going to make it contentious. We're going to make everything political in a fight. The feminists alongside them at the time are coining the personal is political and that total shit show of an idea. And so politics has to be brought in. Divisive, awful, icky politics has to be brought into everything the middle class might like so that they can become alienated at a cultural level. So that's how cultural Marxism incorporates into neo-Marxism. But they're also just railing on the consumerist society and all of this up until you get to the 1960s. In the 1960s, they're looking around. They see what's going on. Globally, there are all these liberation movements fighting back against the collapse of of colonization of the colonial periods. Uh, So globally, you have that going on. There's, you know... Marcus is praising the Viet Cong. He's praising Che Guevara. Uh, you know, this whole thing is these liberation fronts, which are leftist Marxist projects in a new paradigm against using colonialism as the uh, wedge issue to try to achieve the revolution. That's the whole point of the Marxian theory is to achieve the revolution. Meanwhile, Marcus is looking around in the United States and he's like, man, these feminists are pissed off. We can use them. The unemployed are still the totally downtrodden, the wretched of the earth. We can use them. Uh, the ghetto population, as he calls them, the blacks, the racial minorities, they're pissed off. He's looking at black power, right? Black nationalism rising. You know, we can use that. They're pissed off. And he's like, the, the whole point of his writings through the 60s is how do we cobble together a movement? He's also looking at China and hearing about the success of the Cultural Revolution in terms of achieving what is it achieving. Uh, I don't think that he, I, I do think that Marcuse is an evil man. Uh, no question. I don't think he's so evil as to know that there were millions being killed by the by the Cultural Revolution in China. I think he was probably ignorant of the fact that there was a complete humanitarian catastrophe. Um, but he was a big fan of Mao's revolution as far as he knew it, writing in the 60s, which is when, you know, I don't know how much truth was getting out about that. Um, also, by the way, by this point in the 1960s, uh, they're having to reckon with the fact that Bolshevism is in is in rough shape in its old Soviet form. The Soviet Union, Khrushchev has come out and confessed to the sins of Stalin. And so everything post mid 1950s in Marxism has to be framed against this. I think this is where postmodernism actually emerged. I mean, it was from its own intellectual tradition that traces back to Rousseau, really, but uh, in a long line. But that's beside the point. They post Marxist sentiment in the postmodern theorists in the 1960s and going into the 70s very heavily, I would assume, relied on the fact that they were looking at the disgusting sins of Stalin as confessed by Khrushchev, and they're having to freaking deal with this. And the postmodernists went into full despair, whereas the um, neo-Marxists were like, huh, we're just using the wrong people and we're doing it the wrong way. We need, in Marcuse's own words, we need to have you know, socialism without the bureaucracies. The Soviet experiment was was a failure because it was forced and because it became bureaucratic and bureaucratic became technocratic and it became, you know, this terrible thing. And that's the huge mistake of socialism. But capitalism, he says, making the same mistake and but in a different way. And he says, I've already read it, so you could you can go listen to it. Uh, our argument through um, actually both repressive tolerance, but especially an essay on liberation, uh, where he's dealing with it. It's also in One Dimensional Man, if you want to read that. Uh, also, he also rails on it in Counter-Revolution and Revolt, if you want to read that. Um, I have not read that one uh, on the podcast. So anyway, they're trying to deal with all of this, and they're they're playing the mid-culture, uh, pop culture war, and they're realizing it's not working very well. But those become the kind of like, it is working to a degree, and those become the sites of agitation that they then cobble into this, uh, you know, weird coalition, student movement led weird coalition from the 60s radicals. They were were basically turned against their society, against the man, against all the trappings of pop culture. Hippies are going to dress weird and they're going to party and they're going to do acid and they're going to just kind of like, 
you know, refuse the society. Um, uh, Marcuse called it the great refusal. And he looked at the hippies. He even mentions the hippies specifically. And he says that they have the right energy. It's just that they're kind of useless. And so um, you have in the 1960s this shift. And in particular, the realization that identity politics can emerge out of the civil rights movement, out of the feminist movement, uh, out of the gay rights movement, and that there's a very fruitful line of very radicalizable um, people in this regard, centered A, in the university, and B, in these so-called marginalized populations that need so-called liberation. And Marcuse even says they should be in solidarity with these movements like the Viet Cong and whatever. And so the, 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 the liberation fronts around the world. And so the Vietnam War becomes a huge huge framing point to radicalize a generation, which it did. And this is what we call now the new left. And Marcusa is recognized as the um, the father of the new left. Well, when we read Isaac Gotsman, again, in Critical Turn in, in Education, he points out the new left faltered. It didn't last very long. Once the war, Vietnam War, ended, it st stumbled. I don't know if that's the best way to put it. But he says what we had on the other side of the, the new left, which was quite radical and violent in the streets, very protesty is the emergence of what he calls the academic left, which would be literally academic Marxism. And this is where it creeps into the universities, and this is where from the universities it creeps into the K-12 through education system, and that's why all the 60s radicals went into the classroom, also into educational administration, also into uh, colleges of education, which you can say it's a classroom, but it's a different paradigm. And so this is the emergence, though. The goal was, and we've covered this in the podcast, about Marcusa and the New Proletariat, the goal was to create an emerging new working class or new proletariat that's rooted in identity politics, such that by 1977, when the Combahee River Collective makes its statement, which formed in uh, 1974, this is a collection of radical black feminists who are almost all lesbians. So you have basically the intersectional coalition happening here. Uh, there's Marxist black feminists uh, who are looking for liberation, but they actually laid all the seeds for intersectionality. Crenshaw would have been aware of them for sure and adapted much of what she thought from them. Uh, this is where you have the infusion of identity politics and all of these race, sex, gender, sexuality, Eventually, in 1980, we get to ability status working its way in. Eventually, later, we have fat status working its way in, trying to get in on the grift. Uh, now we have mental health status and previous trauma status and, you know, anything you can possibly imagine status working in as identity factors. But this is where you have this infusion of identity first thinking uh, and identity politics into the Marxian strategy. So neo Marxism shoots off. Neo-Marxism continued, by the way. Uh, critical theory continued with Jürgen Habermas as another generation of critical theory, uh, qua critical theory, and nobody cares about that. I mean, I, academics who do it care about it. Nobody else cares about it. Uh, it doesn't have any significant social impact except to be this annoying academic thing that happens and sometimes has little effects in here and there. Meanwhile, you have this huge new left push, whether it's the critical legal studies movement or all these identity politics movement, which, by the way, the critical legal studies movement and by the 85, 86 thereabouts gets taken over by critical race theory as it's emerging and is named in 1989 uh, as that project. And so that's what happened there. But what you actually have going on is that there, there's a, you know, you can think of it like there being an exit ramp to another interstate in the critical theory neo-Marxist line. And that exit ramp is identity politics. And they take the identity politics uh, line, they uh, exit, they, they reframe Marxism across the stratifications of social power. And this includes the conflation of culture and identity. So now if you're black, there's black culture. If you're Mexican, there's well, there is actually Mexican culture because Mexico is its own nation. But if, if you're Hispanic, there's like a Latino culture. And the, what, what happens is that they're trying to create uh, authentic black or brown or Latino or whatever voices where they define authentic in terms of the stratification theory of Marxism. And in fact, 
it's not even a stratification theory. It's a revolutionary theory. It is the goal to turn these people into social revolutionaries. And so identity Marxism is born out of a subset of the radical aspects, most radical aspects of the civil rights movement. It's a complete departure from the civil rights movement. Uh, absolute, which was, which was framed to get people, get America and, and the West to live up to the promises laid down, say, in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which it had not lived up to yet. That's a very liberal, American, universal, individualist uh, project. But over here, instead, we have this identity politics, which is very fractious. And the, the, the best expression of the difference is, of course, given at the end. I've read uh, this in the podcast as well. The, the last part of Kimberly Crenshaw, who named critical race theory, uh, last part of her famous 1991 paper called Mapping the Margins, there's this very important paragraph where she actually is criticizing the preceding and following paragraph. She's she's criticizing postmodernism for being too deconstructive. Uh, she calls it vulgar constructionism versus or constructivism. I don't remember which one it is. It doesn't really matter. Um, she She's criticizing that uh, for trying to deconstruct racial identity by failing to recognize that racial identity is imposed by these magical power structures in society, racism in particular in this case, but the mar margins are both racism and sexism. Her argument in mapping the margins, what are the margins? The margins are black feminism. Uh, and why? Because the black liberation movement has pushed the feminist issue to the margins and the, um, the, feminist movement, which is characterized as white feminism, has pushed black issues to the margins. And so black feminism is marginalized doubly by these. And intersectionality is supposed to be the very radical thesis that takes these two very radical movements and turns them reflexively inward on each other and on themselves so that black liberationism now has to deal with its internal uh, sexism and misogyny or whatever, according to these people. And so they can manipulate and gain control over that movement to the degree that it accepts that thesis. And then the feminism movement can be and was very much so brought to heel by accusing it of being racist. Same thing happened in the critical legal studies movement is they got accused of being racist and got brought to heel. And so what she has in this paragraph in mapping margins, this is the I am black paragraph. So if you open a copy of the paper and you keyword search, I am black, you can very easily find this paragraph. And what she argues is that there is a fundamental difference between the statements, I am black and I am a person who happens to be black. She says there's a fundamental difference between those things. And then what she says is that I'm a person who happens to be black strains for a certain universality that she believes does not exist. And she says, in effect, that I am first a person rather than one would suppose I am first an identity. And what she says about I am black is that it is an anchor for subjectivity and a fruitful site to create a po meaningful politics of identity. And so what she's actually, and she invokes actually the black, pa black uh, power movements, black is beautiful as an example of what that means as an anchor of subjectivity. So in other words, as a subject, you are now supposed to understand your, and as a postmodern view. You're now supposed to understand yourself as being politically black in order to be authentically black. And so you can see where the identity Marxist and why, because it's imposed, because the racial category is imposed from the outside by the power structure of whiteness and white supremacy that you can't get away from if you're black and you can't deconstruct if you're black because you are caught in the victim or the, uh, within the master slave dialectic, it's, it's called the slave position within that you don't, the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's houses that you're saying that you're in the slave position. So therefore you don't have the tools necessary to dismantle uh, the master's house and you have to, if you play within the, the, the usual rules, so you now have to make your own rules and be very radical. Um, we could invoke Franz Fanon here, but that's a topic for another day. And so this is the birth really of identity Marxism. It's also the birth of what we would call critical constructivism, which is the fusion of this critical theory, AKA critical Marxism and postmodern theory, AKA post Marxist, uh, anti-capitalism and, it's, just, it's the fusion of those two things is happening here. And that's really, I don't want to say that mapping the margins is the birth of identity Marxism. It certainly would have already been happening at the 12 years earlier or even 15 years earlier with the Combahee River Collective or 17 years earlier, I guess, doing the math quickly in my head. Um, it's certain, certainly would have been already occurring in, in, in 
even in the, the early 1970s, in fact, uh, this shift into an identity Marxism where identity stratification becomes the line. Just so, so now we back up to Marx. Marx didn't care one iota about economic status whatsoever. He didn't actually care. The only way that he cared was that he hated the people richer than him because he wasn't, and he was disgusted by the people poorer than him because he didn't want to have to fall to their level. And so it's a total theory of resentment. And the point of Marxism was to achieve revolution by whatever means, any means necessary, and the most fruitful means to be able to agitate society, stratify society, and put it in conflict that might achieve that revolution so that it could achieve its regressive project of a new aristocracy that it's in charge of uh, in defiance and resentment of the existing order of society is by using economic class under industrial capitalism. And so that's all Marxism is. Now we're following Marcusa and he says all the vital needs, the energy, the revolutionary energy, all of that is tucked away in the ghetto population. So if we can agitate them to become infused with theory, if we can give them the critical consciousness, the new sensibility, if we can make them dependent upon the institutional structure of society, uh, in order to uh, radicalize them into saying that they um, want out of their dependency by any means necessary. So if we can sufficiently alienate them, then we have this. So in this sense, you can easily see that identity Marxism doesn't care about the identities that it's manipulating. It doesn't care about black people if it's critical race theory or brown people. It uses them. It uses them. It doesn't care about black faces that don't want to be black voices. It doesn't care about brown faces that don't want to be brown voices. Uh, queer theory and gender theory when they're in these Marxian frames. So it's another strain of identity Marxism. Don't care about gay people. They don't. They don't care about lesbians. They don't care about any of these. They care about people who are going to use the resentment based in their identity to push the Marxian politics so that you can get toward a revolution by destabilizing society, tearing apart the fu fundamental cultural institutions, etc. And the way that identity Marxism works is it takes that neo-Marxist view of society that we just discussed a moment ago, and it reinfuses the cultural Marxism idea, but it attaches a culture to an identity status. So if you're gay, you have gay culture. And gay culture is marginalized by, by cis-heteronormativity. And so you have to become, that's, that's a power structure, the structural fabric of society. And so you have to tear that fabric of society apart. And that's the only way you can achieve liberation. If you're black or if you're brown, you're oppressed by white supremacy. And the only possible way to be liberated from the structure of white supremacy that's baked into the fundamental aspect of society is to become politically conscious of it, of it being the nature of society, of the fabric of society, and we need to rip that societal fabric apart. So this is, again, it is a very regressive movement that it uses people as tokens and icons so that it can achieve its one and only aim, which is to achieve a revolution, a social and cultural revolution, using cultural Marxist tools to precede a uh, material Marxist revolution. Now, material Marxism is not going to be like Lenin. Leninism 1.0 was 1917. That's over 100 years ago now. It's not going to be like Stalin. It's going to be somewhat more like Mao, and we're seeing that. You know, the educational changes that they made are an attempt to reproduce in America and then throughout the West what Mao did in the schools in China to create a Red Guard in the young people. The radicalized student movement is what they refer to that Red Guard as in the West, and it's going to go tear apart the order of society by getting away from everything old, everything outdated, everything racist, sexist, etc. from the past. All of the old cultural icons, all of the icons of society like Thomas Jefferson statues and Thomas Jefferson himself, whatever, uh, it's all going to have to be torn down. But it's also to pit the younger generation against the older generations, their parents, their grandparents, their teachers, the authority figures in adult society, and replace them with these radical youth who don't know anything except that they're radicalized and angry because they've been radicalized and made angry by this theory. In other words, they've been men made mentally ill by by critical theory. And so it's going to be different though, because what happened is in the 1980s and going into the 1990s, uh, China, which was a straight post Mao China was a straight, they used a cultural revolution to achieve a material revolution and they became a straight Marxist communist society. And then eventually you end up having Deng Xiaoping come along. And I've talked about this in the past as well on the podcast. So you can go find that. Um, and he puts the he opens up the corporate markets, allows people to do limited capitalism with what he called Chinese characteristics, by which he meant CCP 
characteristics. The Chinese Communist Party is going to become the, the, the entity that allows and structures and orders and maintains and, and guardrails uh, how capitalism is allowed to happen in China. And so what you actually have there is a model that fuses communism and fascism. And like I said, in the Chinese model, communism goes on top and fascism goes underneath. What's occurring currently in this 4.0 Gener new generation attempt is to use identity politics. This is identity Marxism to lock pick open the gates to Western civilization so that you can overthrow it, get your revolution and what will be installed on the other side in the name of equity and justice, racial equity, racial justice, etc., social justice, climate justice, health equity to health justice. What's going to be installed uh, is in fact the the inversion of the Chinese model. The fascism, the corporatism is going to go on top. That's why the corporations are all playing along. They have a, a captive market uh, if they go along with this. And then beneath that, so the fascism goes on top with the communistic redistribution through equity models, through what they call ESG, environmental, social, and governance uh, metrics, and a sustainable development goal program is going to go underneath. So sustainability, et cetera, uh, and equity redistribution is all part and parcel of a over overarching uh, fascistic technocratic model. So that's the goal. But this that's not the topic of today. The topic of today is the emergence of and the existence of identity Marxism. What do I mean by it? And that's why if we go into critical race theory, I call it race Marxism. If we went into queer theory, we could call it uh, gender and sexuality Marxism. If we went into uh, kind of certain aspects of gender critical feminism, even we could, it, depending on how Marxist they are, not all of it is Marxist necessarily, we could actually, or neo-Marxist, we could actually refer to that as sex Marxism. Uh, disability studies could, and fat studies could be disability Marxism and fat Marxism respectively. But what we have then is it, it, broadly, all of these are cobbled together, what we call applied postmodernism or reified postmodernism or social justice scholarship in cynical theories are actually best described as identity Marxism. And identity Marxism is a reframing, it is a neo Marx, it is the adaptation of neo Marxism into uh, a revamping of cultural Marxism where the identity categories become the cultures, which is depends a little bit on a postmodern way of thinking about culture, uh, the different populations are, you know, the, the, the cultural products are all wholly socially contingent, um, et cetera. And this, again, a side topic. I've talked about it before. I don't have to talk about it again. You can read cynical theories and get an idea of what that means. But there's the, the, a shift into the identity political view uh, using the same Marxist idea where the basic Marxist idea is that we're going to identify an uh, irritating to people and alienating social stratification. We're going to exaggerate and pick at that until people are are made um, revolutionary, uh, until they're, they, they come together in solidarity to achieve a revolution. And so what we're facing right now, the woke movement is identity Marxism. The definition of woke is I'm an identity Marxist. What does woke mean? So people need a definition of woke. Woke means that you are awakened to the structural power dynamic understanding of the world, which is a Marxist understanding is the same as class consciousness, but now it's a identity consciousness where consciousness still refers to becoming, having become socialist man as Marx laid it out just in different paradigms and with slightly different uh, manifestations. But the whole point of all Marxist theories is to use whatever it is, class Marxism, identity Marxism, cultural Marxism, whatever it is, the whole point is to use whatever that thing is before Marxism to achieve revolutionary potential and to achieve a revolution that's going to set up a new aristocracy controlled by the people who call themselves the theorists, the authentic theorists and representatives of that idea, because it's a move away from freedom, because in a, in a move away from the uh, natural order of the world, because there is a complete rejection and rebellion of that. And like I said, this all stems back in a sense to the fact that Marx was in fact a Satanist uh, openly uh, and wanted to invert the existing order, whether that's theological or natural, however you want to look at it, and turn it on its head. And to his six stages, the goal is to get to avoid, if possible, even going into the freedom stage and to 
pull it backwards into a new aristocracy that he's actually his his view is actually in charge of people like him are actually in charge of and it cannot be overstated that it's since it's based in resentment it's based in hatred of the people above you and the perceived social hierarchy and a abject loathing fear of the people below you that it's just going to be a tyrannical mess every single time so critical race theory is the race version of this race marxism it doesn't matter which identity factor you want it's identity marxism and if you understand what marxism is actually about and that the various pieces whether it's class race sex gender sexuality disability status fat status whatever are actually all interchangeable just cultural uh, aspects are, are all interchangeable pieces to just to achieve that revolutionary energy. It's very easy to understand what's what's actually in front of us and what the stakes are, therefore, in terms of dealing with it and fighting back against it, which obviously becomes an extreme necessity. Uh, and it becomes very easy to see where the writing on the wall is going to be. If you want to know what the model is going to look like, look at China. We'll have a social credit score. All this identity Marxism in a very kind of muted way will be incorporated into it. But, you know, the very radical, critical uh identity theories are basically identity marxist uh activists are going to basically be squashed because they're too reckless and dangerous and we're all going to pay lip service to equity it'll occasionally happen uh your social credit score just as a means of controlling you will depend upon it that you're behaving in the correct way but in a, it's all tokenistic nobody the, the the people in charge do not actually care about any of this they're using it as a pretext that looks moral to be able to do it so they can get the revolution so they can set up the new uh aristocracy or oligarchy or feudal estate or whatever you want to call it that's eventually going to by its own failure transition into a slave state that will never transform into the uh global uh, utopia that they promise by a you know trying to retro engineer a complete regression through if we accept Mar Marxist stages of history, his stages of history in, in reverse, but in an expanding rather than contracting way. So it's a complete catastrophe.